Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Steve Shepard, and I'm the moderator for today's webinar, Elevating Dentistry Together, a discussion with ADA and ADSO leadership. I'm joined today by representatives from both organizations. We have with us Dr. Cesar Sabates, the president of the ADA, Dr. Ray Colmia, the chief executive officer of the ADA, Emmett Scott, who is the president of the ADSO, and Andrew Smith, the chief executive officer of the ADSO. I'd like to thank you all for being with us today. These two organizations have come together for this conversation because, like all industries, dentistry is changing. The underlying technology that makes dental care possible is evolving, and the practitioners and the patients are different, which means that their expectations are different. The truth is that dentistry is a calling. It represents a deeply personal relationship between the caregiver and the patient, but it's also a business. We don't always think of it that way, but it is. And what's clear is that the combined efforts of these two organizations can make dental care more efficient and more effective and more personal than it has ever been, while also flourishing economically and competitively and swinging the doors open much wider to allow new practitioners to step through. So let me welcome all of you, and let me start with this first question, which is fairly broad, and I'd like to start with the ADA. What do you see as the really big, hairy, impactful trends that are happening relative to dentistry? Steve, I'll start out. I, I, don't, I wouldn't phrase it as a hairy uh, a trend, but there are a lot of trends that are going on in dentistry. I, I've been in practice for more than 35 years, and when I first started, uh, the Yellow Pages was something that was extremely powerful. Uh, I don't even think the Yellow Pages exist today. So the way that consumers are interacting with, with uh, their dental practitioner, the way that uh, the practice of dentistry has changed over the years with technology, the, the way the, 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 the backgrounds of individuals that are entering the profession has changed. I remember my father telling me that in his dental school class, there was uh, only one female student. Now, um, the, today's dental school classes are made up of over 50% of the females. So everything is, is changing and it's changing at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, when I started my career, I started out as a solo practitioner. Now it seems like solo practitioners are becoming dinosaurs because the trend is changing uh, as, as the way practices are, are, are managed. And so change is something that's inevitable. We are all welcoming organization. And uh, one of my models during my presidential year was it's a new day for dentistry. And it is truly a new day for dentistry and a new day for the ADA. And this cooperation between ADSO and the ADA is just another example of, of that new day. Dr. Comia, would, would you like to add a little bit? Well, well thank you, Dr. Sabatez. Yeah, you know, when you look at the trends impacting, you know, not just ADA, ADSO, but entire dentistry, we're looking at consumerism, technology, impacts of so many different things that patient expectations are changing dramatically. Even if you look at it from the time that they make an appointment all the time that they that they receive their treatment, the changes are dramatic of what's happening right now. You know, and secondly, when we look at what's happening is, is that we're seeing dentistry change dramatically in the practice modalities the way it's being delivered. You know, when we look at, for example, the impact of DSOs, um, we're seeing a major change here. You know, back, this is data from 2019 even, and we're working on new data as we speak today, but we see that in 2017, you had 8.8% uh, in the DSOs. Now it's up to 10.4 in 2019, and we suspect that number is substantially higher than that right now. What it means is that the, the delivery care that the dentists that traditionally did before is changing dramatically. If you go to the next slide, please, then you can also see for a fact that Fewer dentists are in solo practice because more dentists are coming together to work in a group situation, to work into more of a collaborative process where they're not just so independent, but at the same time, remember the American Dental Association is supporting every type of practice across the board, but we are seeing a trend that less people are in solo practice. Next slide, please. So what's unique about this, as we start to say, when we look at our young dentists that are graduating today, their, their practicing values and their practicing thought processes are differently are substantially different than what they were 20 and 30 years ago. So we can see a definite prevalence that's happening right here where the trend is among younger dentists that they're going less into the solo practice. So it's actually addressing a generational shift too as a dental team model is what they more accept. And the last slide we have here for you 
is that we're seeing also ownership rates. You know, less dentists are getting ownership rates and coming out. One thing that we do know for certain is that as we approach the next five to seven years, we'll probably see this number continue to increase as we go across the board. But ultimately this, is that the ADA is focused on relationship building. We're focused on bringing everybody together. As President Sabatis says, there's a place to, for everybody to belong in the American Dental Association of what we're trying to do. So we're very excited about what we're going to be doing. You know, I was a formerly dean of a university, and this also parallels the fact that we embrace everybody. We embrace the patient. We embrace everybody that's going to help go to change the profession of dentistry and provide better care for the people that we serve. So we're seeing some dramatic shifts in dentistry right now. However, our simplified goal is that we're trying to improve the people's lives that we serve each and every day. How we do that is going to dramatically change when we look at the practice modalities. But one thing is consistent between all of us is improving patients' lives. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Let me turn to the ADSO and uh, ask for your thoughts and comments as well, please. Yeah, you want me to start off here, Andrew? Yeah, sure, please. Go ahead. So I love, um, doctor, the example you gave of yellow pages, uh, because my dad was a yellow page salesman. And uh, so I grew up with um, him winning awards and that being a, a huge, you know, opportunity and getting those big yellow pages. I don't think we could find yellow pages today in most, uh, most homes. But the question is, why did that happen? Because I think what a lot of people wonder is, so why is this happening? And it wasn't that you know a group of people got together and said, let's get rid of these yellow pages. Um, there wasn't a big investment group that came in that said, hey, we know how to eliminate yellow pages. The reality is the customer started wanting something different. And of course there was this thing called the internet that ended up taking off and this thing called Google that was a little bit faster than me trying to flip through these different pages. And so I think one thing to call out is we often think about and should the patient as a customer, but the dentist is a customer too, to somebody. And I think a lot of the trends that you just showed are happening because that customer is looking for a different level of support. And they're asking themselves the question of like, hey, this is how we did things in the past. Is there another way to do this that is easier? Is there a way that I could get you know, more support and frankly, more autonomy to focus on the clinical side and not be focused on any of this back office component. So, you know, as someone who started a podcast around DSOs, involved in DEO, president of ADSO, I've really tried to study like what is going on here in the marketplace. And what I always can find is if you go back to the customer, they'll tell you everything. And what the customer is saying is we want more support. You know, we want it from every association, we want alignment there, and we want it from the private sector as well. We want you to help us out. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to, to add to <clears throat> Emmett's point and what everybody else has said, you know, we've seen the cost of entering dentistry become very cost prohibitive. You know, many, many students are coming out with increasingly large and sizable amounts of debt. As we know, opening a practice uh, solo can be, you know, very difficult and very costly. So to, you know, Emmett's point, um, you know, we're, we're starting to see, you know, dentists entering into a DSO because of that continued support and just another option. Um, you know, like the ADA, ADSO is very much committed to making sure that uh, the next generation of dentists finds their appropriate practice home. And, and I'm really excited to, to work with ADA. I think that's a, a, a major trend of dentistry being more unified. Um, I think for all of us, we've been very much siloed for a number of years, whether it was general dentistry to orthodontics to, you know, endo or, you know, solo practice versus group practice, DSO. You know, what I've seen in my short tenure here at ADSO is just that elevation of the profession and um, the unification, which is, I think, a really exciting opportunity because we together can really highlight um, the profession and make sure that more and more people are, are entering into dentistry, uh, especially those that haven't historically uh, been in dentistry. And I think that's, a, that's an exciting thing. You know, one of the things we've seen when we've talked to dental students is more and more of them, I think about 30 percent are now interested in entering into a DSO. And I, I kind of want to peel back that onion a little and see, you know, is it because it's cost prohibitive to get in? Is it because of the support um, in that way? Well, at the end of the day, I think it's our job to make sure that every single person is um, finding the right practice home, but also encouraging more and more folks to get into the profession. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to working with this group to make sure that that continues. 
can can I call out to th that data was in 2019. You know, how was your 2020? How was your 2021? And I think on a very human level, all of us would gr agree that it was very chaotic. And as we're in 2022 now, it has not let up. <laughs> you know, the HR component has never been quite this hard in any industry and healthcare especially. So again, I think the consumer, the, the customer doctor is going to continue to say, can I get some HR help here? Man, this ransomware IT thing is crazy. Could I get some help there? You know, this financial component is really difficult. So those are the things I think are going to continue to trend is we want support, you know, just generally. Let me shift gears just a little bit here and, and ask a slightly different question. There's a there's a lot of uncertainty right now around the economy, where it's headed, especially as we move beyond the pandemic. Now, we all know the pandemic is still there in one form or another, as are issues related to supply chain and concerns about the Ukraine conflict and so on. So let me ask you this, and I'd like to start with the ADSO on this one. How do you see the current economy affecting care for patients? Is it making it harder to deliver? Has it had an effect? And if so, uh, what do you see as that actually being? Yeah, I think what we're seeing as we're coordinating with other dentists, dentist groups, DSOs, is the HR component for sure is more difficult than it's ever been. This inflationary component that we say is eight or 9%, I think at the labor level is feels more like 20, 50%. And so when you have that much turnover, then you have chaos for the dentist as well. Um, and I think the dentists are also trying to figure out, you know, where do they want to land? Where do they want to live? And so there's just lots of movement uh, within the space. You know, dentistry has always prided itself on being pretty recession proof. Uh, people keep getting born with teeth, continue to consume carbohydrates or continue to want to keep their teeth later in life. So those things continue to be very resilient. This inflationary component is new. And I think as we're trying to increase access to care and we're trying to figure out all these labor components, the, the cost metrics and innovation requirements are going up dramatically. You know, I was talking to a, another entrepreneur and I thought to myself, why is McDonald's look more innovative than most dental practices? And that's because they've been under inflationary pressures ever since they probably came out with the dollar menu. <laughs> you know, it's like, we can't get past this dollar. How do we make things more accessible? And so they've had to innovate uh, like crazy. I think dentistry is now entering an era where the consumer I think was mentioned wants convenience like crazy. They frankly want to know you, but never talk to you. They want to connect with you, but do it through some kind of texting or other platform. And that's just one example. How are we going to do that together? I think that's going to be something that as associations we have to work on and as individual groups, we start have to start innovating around. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to on Emmett's point, you know, at ADSO, we have roughly about 100 members, um, you know, that do north of about $15 billion in revenue, you know, kind of, you know, small, medium, large style DSOs, talking to them about current market conditions, it, it, it ranges um, wildly, you know, some are seeing kind of, you know, capped rates and rates not going up and what does the inflationary pressure do there. And then there are some that are just in kind of rapid growth mode still, uh, and in growing, particularly the specialty practices. So, there's, you know, everybody's being affected differently. But the number one thing I hear from our members time and time again are the workforce challenges, both wage pressure and um, workforce supply. Um, there's still a good demand, as Emmett mentioned, of patients coming in. Um, we've seen a little of it maybe tick down, but now it's kind of going back up as gas prices have kind of more at least getting back to somewhere normal. But, you know, one of the things that we are hugely focused on at ADSO is developing the next future generation of workforce, which we mentioned before. And so, you know, one of the things I'm really looking forward to working with ADA on and, you know, the AAO on and everybody else is how do we talk to students, you know, either the student leaders at ASDA, various dental schools to kind of showcase the various different models and opportunities that are afforded to them? How do we make sure we create that pipeline? How do we make sure we get more people into dentistry? So, you know, what are we doing in high school and in college around STEM, you know, things like that, encouraging that pipeline. But one thing that I don't hear as much about that I think 
is hugely, hugely important is continuing to develop the pipeline of dental assistants and hygienists. And I know one thing at ADSO we're very focused on, and next year we're going to be working with, with a handful of policymakers in the states, is trying to figure out how can we help work with state governments, either at technical schools or community colleges, to implement programs that really um, increase dental assistant positions and hygienists. So there's a good supply to meet that demand and that we continue to have people that are entering into the profession. So I think, you know, again, going back to that recession proof, we it's on us, in my opinion, to continue to develop the next uh, future generation of the workforce, not just the dentist, but everybody within the office as well. And I think, again, that's another way of how we elevate the profession, provide access to care uh, and bring bring new faces into dentistry. Excellent. Ray, say, sir. Let me turn to you. Yeah, I, I will tell you that uh, Emmett and Andrew have really defined uh, pretty much uh, the same concerns we have at the American Dental Association. At the American Dental Association, one of our goals is that every member succeed, and we provide the resources necessary uh, for our members to succeed. And these workforce issues have been uh, quite challenging in, in the last few years, and uh, we have been working towards this, and we look forward to collaborating with ATSO and other agencies in order to improve these workforce shortages. I'll tell you personally, uh, I had a uh, office manager that was my office manager for over 20 years. And all of a sudden, one day she just left. There was uh, no explanation. It, it just happened. And this, this history is repeating itself uh, throughout the nation. And so this workforce shortage and this workforce uh, crisis is something that's extremely important. And there is some generational components to this. And maybe Dr. Comille would like to uh, elaborate on, on those generations. And, and Dr. Shepard, you, you have a great experience with these generational trends, and maybe you may want to comment on some of these things as well. Thank you, sir. Ray? Well, you know, it, it, there's a lot of factors happening, and unfortunately, they're shaping up to make the perfect storm, which has really been challenging for, for, for all the dental profession. You know, when you talk about trying to deliver care to patients, exactly that. You know, they, you know, they bring up some really good points. My, my colleagues here, when you talk about the staffing issues and you combine that with the cost of operations. So now, you know, dentists are having worked longer in order to see the same number of patients because they don't have the staffing to support that. And then if you add in the fact that the inflationary processes have come into play is again, it's a, it's a perfect storm that works against the patient because the number one reason that we're having difficulty with access to care, remember is cost. The cost of dental care is one of the number one reasons. Um, so we're working on that. You know, the American Dental Association as, as President Sabatis says, it's, it's, we're bringing everybody together to work and focus on this because this is all out of advocacy comes into involved to help to, to change the culture, to understand, to invest into our profession, invest into the people that we serve is a critical aspect there, to help to control this inflationary process right now, to work with our schools, to work with our curriculum and all of our states to, to probably bring in programs, you know, as Andrew said, from hygiene programs to dental assisting programs, starting to populate. One thing to remember though, is when we talk about hygiene, that is not something you just turn the switch on. That's an accredited program and it takes some time. So even if we start right now, we're not going to see an impact for three to four years of the hygiene zone and probably one to two years on the dental assisting side as well. So we've got a ways to go, but there's one thing that we need to do is to stay together because now these are common issues that are facing all of us, you know, bringing people together, taking a common message to our representatives, our legislatures, all the people that help us to make the decisions of investing into the future of not just our profession, but really investing into the future of our patients and the people we serve. We got a little ways to go, but we've got some great opportunities in front of us as well. Excellent, excellent. The next question I wanted to ask, you you all may have already answered, but I'm gonna ask it just in case there's anything you wanna add. And that is, if you take into account everything we've talked about already, what do you see as the specific challenge or challenges facing the dental practice, the individual practice itself? Are there other issues that uh, that we want to talk about? And uh, ADA, I'll come back to you on this one. I'm flip-flopping back and forth here to start. Yeah, one thing that we haven't talked about, Steve, is that we still have 40 to 50 percent of the U.S. population that doesn't visit the dentist. And that's something that we need to work together to help educate the public of the importance of their oral health. And uh, the mouth is connected to the rest of the body and it's, it's it, the uh, health of a human being is dependent on all systems functioning properly. So oral health is essential health and that's a message that we need to get out there. And I think that we can work together to help uh, get more patients into the dental offices. 
you know, when we look at, as President Sabbath has just said, and it's critical to note that, yeah, 40 to 60 percent of the people aren't seeking, aren't having access to dental care on a regular basis. So, you know, when we look at our low income groups and our adults and seniors, cost barriers are the number one reason why they're not getting dental care. You know, dentistry still stands out as unaffordable. That's something we've got to work on in order to address that as we move to the future. Now, we've talked about some of those things, but, you know, we've got other things like third payer party issues, because remember, if we're not reimbursed, I mean, there is a certain amount of overhead that's involved in delivering care to a patient, and there's only so much that you can lower that until you reach a point that we can't no longer serve that. You know, Dr. Shepard, when we look at that, there, we, we can't go any lower. There's a, it, you have to pay the bills to keep the lights on, et cetera. And those costs continue to go up. And so when you put the third party payer issues into the pressures of the mix, that even adds further to another big challenge facing dentistry. So we're gonna have to really be addressing that factor as well as we approach the future. Excellent. And, and I would just, I was gonna say exactly what Dr. Colmia said. I mean, I, I don't, I see it more as an opportunity about how, ADSO and ADA can work together uh, and, and bring in the third party payers to figure out, you know, kind of how um, we have a better collaborative uh, relationship and trying to figure that out. Um, everything that Dr. Colmia said, 100% agree with. And I know it's something that we are <clears throat> jointly working on uh, together. And I, I think that's probably the biggest opportunity uh, right now uh, for, for, for us in a practice. Can I uh, bring it back to Yellow Pages for a second <laughs> uh, for these for these practices? In 1995, we get this thing called the internet. And in 2007, we get this thing called the iPhone. Shortly thereafter, we get Facebook and then Instagram and social media. What's interesting about what's happening from a marketing perspective is that previously, it was very difficult for our wants to trump our needs. We kind of know knew what we needed and we would go get those done. We'd go to the bank and we'd make those deposits. We'd go to the doctor and we'd get those checkups. When that social media gave direct access to individuals, the marketing landscape changed dramatically, and we can actually change the brain to make people think that their wants are their needs. And if we in dentistry don't have a loud enough voice, a sophisticated enough voice for that, we will keep, get put in a corner. And I think to some extent that has happened, and we're way too critical to let that happen. So. I, I think that that's number one. I think number two is now everyone wants convenience. They want the time to be open all the time. They want the access to be easy all the time. So these are things that we can step into, but we're so critical. Um, the, the mouth body connection is so critical. The need for health and healthiness is so critical. Like to me, it's exciting, but it's something that we have to, we have to solve. Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. Now, you mentioned the internet arriving in 1995, Google in 2006, the iPhone in 2007. Some would say that heralded the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> you know, And there are days when I would argue in favor of that. So let me switch gears just a little bit here. Uh, and actually, Andrew, you brought up something really important. And I'll start with you on this one. When I first kicked this thing off, I said that these two organizations have come together to make dentistry as a whole better than it's ever been before, both as a caregiving, care provisioning, care management organization, but also as a business. And to me, this represents one of those great examples of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So, Andrew, let me start with you. Why do you need the ADA? Why does the ADSO need the ADA? And then we'll flip the question around to the other side. No, absolutely. I think it's a it's a it's a great question, and to me, it's a it's a no brainer. You know, ADA has been the professional organization for organized dentistry for uh, you know a, an incredibly long time. Um, they represent numerous uh, dentists in the profession throughout the United States, and again, uh, we need to be unified uh, to elevate the profession and be able to achieve uh, all that we're we're, we're doing. And um, you know, Dr. Colmey and I always talk about how we agree probably on ninety eight percent. In fact, I feel like we haven't found an issue yet that we don't really agree on. Uh, maybe some of our our member folks uh, might be able to you know pick up you know one or two percent of things, but. Honestly, I, I don't see where we we disagree on issues. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I selfishly, I need the ADA to be able to deliver continued value for my members businesses to grow. Um, and I think the ADA provides that and working collaboratively with them will 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 achieve that. Can, can I just add to that? We have two sets of customers 
we're calling out here. One is the patients. And it's critical that we have clinicians who are able to work together, network together, to be able to provide the highest level of clinical care to those patients. That is ADA, right? They are providing all the lobbying effort, government affairs, all of the networking to allow those clinicians to continue to upgrade clinical uh, pieces of care. Then there's all this back-end administrative. <laughs> there's all this HR, this IT. And frankly, we need those HR individuals networking together to figure out how to solve this. This isn't dentist against dentist. This is dentist against every other part of the industry, as I mentioned, right? It's like, we need to hire them so they don't go to Netflix or somewhere else. Like we need them in our industry. So who's going to do that part of the networking? Who's going to get these CFOs upgraded so that they're making sure that the controls are in place so dentists aren't taken advantage of? Who's going to make sure that we have the highest level of IT support so ransomware isn't coming into these practices, stealing PHI information? I don't feel like that should be all on the ADA. I think that's an ADSO responsibility to figure out some of these business innovations so that their support and the ADA can really focus on the clinical care that needs to happen in the industry. I think it's really interesting. So to, uh, ADA, why do you need the ADSO? Well, let's flip this thing on its head. That's a very simple uh, question, uh, Steve. We are better when we're together. And Andrew mentioned something, and it's been the basis of probably my service to dentistry. And it's a quote from Walt Disney. And he always said that the things that unite us far outweigh and outnumber those that divide us. And, you know, Andrew mentioned the 2%. I really don't know what the 2% is because sometimes we focus on that 2% instead of focusing on the 98% of the things that, that, that we work well together. And it's a perfect fit. Uh, you know, they're supporting dentists, we're supporting dentists, um, we, we uh, provide standards, we provide so many things, we have been leaders in the dental profession for so many years, and it's just a logical fit. The ADA is one big family, and we need ADSO, we need all of our member dentists to, to work together uh, for one cause. And one of the things we haven't talked about is the third-party payers, we've talked about it briefly, but it's something that we can work together and uh, help all our members succeed, which is the overall uh, function of the ADA. But more importantly, to improve the health, not just the oral health, but the health of our nation. That's what the ADA is about. And I'm sure that's uh, part of ADSO's uh, mission as well. So we working together as a synergistic relationship that we can elevate the profession of dentistry far into the next century. You know, the things, Steve, that the ADA does behind the scenes, people probably don't realize. When it comes to, when we look at advocacy, that's that's a critical thing I've mentioned and becoming together in a stronger voice, being unified to support the profession and the people we serve is critical. You know, I one of my favorite things was a movie from a long time ago when when a young boy asked an older person, he said, how, how can they change and how can they close our school just like this? And it was a simple statement of with a stroke of a pen. And we have to be careful because a stroke of a pen can change how we have that relationship with patients, how we do this coming together and maintaining the strength of all of us is critical. We need ADSO and they need us. We need everybody to come together and start to focus on what our similarities are. You know, some other things that the ADA does behind the scenes, most people don't, is, is we talk about the standards. You know, we talk about the technologies that establishes the materials process, the burr instrumentation products. You know, this is what, dude, we do the uh, science. You know, we, we're one of the few associations, I believe the only association actually, that has an entire science industry that does an independent process that works specifically for the profession to advance everything that we do to deliver the highest amount of quality of care. Well, these things cost money. These things all cost you know, time and effort that we do. The American Dental Association is poised and has been and is positioned perfectly as we approach the future that we can all come together. So yes, we eat, we all need each other to forge the future. It's the only way that we're going to ensure, one, the succinctity of the profession, and two, those patients that we serve are treated at the highest level possible. So we need each other very, very much. And that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm excited about what we're doing today. Dr. Shepard, thank you. Again, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Cesar, you made reference to Disney, and I did some work for Disney over the years in their technology world. And it's very interesting. If you walk into their boardroom, 
they have engraved on the wall their mission statements. Very simple. It's three words. And it actually relates to the next topic I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, when you ask people, what do you think Disney's mission statement is? They kind of wander all over. But it's really an interesting comment. It's make people happy. And it's, it's genius. It's genius. Because if you think about it, if I'm an employee of Disney, it doesn't matter if my job is to cook hot dogs in the park or operate the Peter Pan ride or pick up trash or work in the data center. No, no, no. My job is to make people happy. How I execute that relative to my specific skills is what's critical. So the point is you make people happy in a variety of different ways by doing the right thing. One of the areas that as many of you know that I, uh, that I do a lot of work in is this strange field of, of generational theory, sometimes called cohort theory, which really kind of looks at how different generations in the workplace want to be attracted and motivated and rewarded and developed and communicated with and so on. You know, older generations, you know, we baby boomers often roll our eyes and sort of joke about the younger generation, while younger generations kind of roll their eyes and joke about us. But the truth is that all of these generations are profoundly different in a lot of different ways. And each one of them, whether we're talking about baby boomers or Generation X or the millennials or the recently arrived plurals, the newest generation, all bring unique value to society and to the workplace, including the world of dentistry. So what I'd like to ask all of you now, and I'm gonna start with the ADA on this one, is how are generational divides or generational differences playing out in the organization? I mean, how is it manifesting in terms of opportunities and challenges and just interesting observations? What are you seeing? Steve, I'm going to let Dr. Comia start this because uh, he's worked as a dean of a dental school and he has seen these changes uh, firsthand. And I think he'll be able to express this uh, much better than I will ever. And uh, to be honest with you, I still miss the yellow pages, but uh, that's the, the other point. Well, uh, and let's face it, Ray is also a millennial. So we want to make sure that he gets his day in court. Here, oh, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabatez. You know, it's funny when y'all mention yellow pages, for some reason, I think of a dog and a book laying on the ground. So I'm not really, it's been a while since we actually thought about yellow pages for that matter. But, you know, when you look at the generational shift, and it's critical because our market is baby boomers, Generation Xs, and millennials. And right now, about a third, third, and third make up across the board. But, you know, Dr. Shepard, within five to seven years, you're going to see the baby boomers kind of rolling off the screen and the Generation Xs, millennials. And their value thought process is a little different than what it was before. That's why you're seeing them aligning more with the dental team thought processes. And that's why the dental service organizations are becoming so predominantly popular because they answer a way of life that this individual group is looking for too. You know, when they look for, it's, it's wonderful because the baby boomers, you know, we're, we're workaholics. You know, we won't miss work. We, we, we'll give you the evenings and the weekends, but we see the younger generations is the opposite. I'm really jealous because their work-life balance is so exceptional. You know, I, I, I can always relax after I put about an 80 or 90 hour work week in, you know, that type of thing where it's the exact opposite for the upcoming generations. Because I'll tell you right now, you know, it, back in 2014, 15, you know, as a dean, we were, we were talking about this and we were seeing, oh, I think it was around 12, you know, 15% graduates were saying we're going to go into a business dental service organization or business affiliation group of some kind. I suspect that number is probably 30, 35% right now and continuing to rise because it answers a way of life that they're looking for. That work-life balance is so critically important that they also bring into the fact that dental team, you know, well, somebody takes care of the insurance, somebody else takes care of the assistance, somebody does this. I want to focus on practicing the dentistry and may not be so involved with running. That doesn't mean that solo practitioner is going to go away by any means, because even though we talk about 20, 25% DSO, 75% are through the federal services, through solo practitioners, associateship. There's a broad range that's going to be focusing, that was going to be facing us over the next several years. But these generational changes are critical on how we're going to be delivering care. But it's unique to see how they figure out ways to create better opportunities to serve the people that they want to do in the way that their lifetime sets forward. So as these generational processes come forward, you know, I suspect by the year 2032, when they see the generation alphas come into play and the plural generations, we're going to see even a different shift in the practice modalities of what the, of the opportunities are. We all have to be positioned. Each one of us in our organizations have to be positioned to understand those values and to embrace them. So no matter what their practice is, 
we can embrace and support them to, again, support the profession and treat the patients at the highest level possible. So I'll tell you one thing, this generational is pretty interesting how the generational gap is changing dramatically right now and will continue to change over the next five to seven years. Absolutely. So is there anything to add? I think he pretty well summed it up. Uh, things are changing constantly and the uh, work-life balance is something that is extremely important to these newer generations. And we all have to adapt. Uh, our, our membership is, is changing and the ADA has to be there for, for everyone. Not Indeed. only different ages, but different practice modalities. Uh, we just have to be a place where everyone is welcome. That's what, that, what we're striving to do. That's what it has to be. And, you know, it's interesting. You hear people say that, you know, like millennials, they don't care about money. You know, as far as I can tell, they haven't learned how to photosynthesize to eat yet. They need money, just like everybody else. But how they get it, how they're rewarded, how they're motivated and attracted, it's different by generation. And that's that's a critical sort of sensitivity that we have to have. Let me let me turn the uh, let me turn the conversation over to Emmett and Andrew. What what are your thoughts on this? How is it affecting you? Well, let's assume that humans aren't actually that different, but their circumstances are. Uh, one of the things that I think is different from each generation is as this technology has developed, what hasn't changed is biologically, our brain can only take in so much. And so I think we had a lot more bandwidth uh, mentally than we have today. I can watch play by play what's happening in another country with their war, their economics, what our own country, a lot of things that are frankly outside of my control my brain can take a lot of input on. And I think we're still figuring out with all of this new technology, how are we going to balance our anxieties, our emotions, our workload, our effort mm -hmm. um, with all of this new opportunity? And so I think we see those in, in generational shifts. And I think part of the way we're doing that is we're saying, okay, we're going to prioritize what's most important here. And if I bring this back to dentists, they're going to say, the most important thing is I've got to be available to show up and provide quality care to a patient. That means these other things I need somebody else to be doing. You know, and as the dentist I partnered with said, while I was going through eight years of schooling around healthcare and dentistry, somebody else was doing that in IT, somebody else was doing that in HR, somebody else was doing that in finance. Why wouldn't we do some level of division of labor? So I think that's what we're seeing is a little bit more sophistication, but really it's coming down to just a human component of how am I going to define success? How am I going to have work-life balance? You know, and what do I want mentally and emotionally uh, for me in my life? Excellent point. Andrew, you want to add anything? There? Sure. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I think everybody's touched on it. I'll be, I'll be pretty brief, but we're certainly a society that's, you know, very mobile on the go um, today. And, you know, I think, you know, when we talk with a lot of dental students or associate, you know, dentists, you know, they view, you know, workforce as much more portable, you know, where it's, I think, historically, uh, you know, you, you'd get out of dental school, you'd go plant a flag and, you know, my town, Greenwich, Connecticut, and you'd be a dentist there for 30 to 40 years. And I, you know, I, I currently see one of those dentists and that's, and that they give amazing standard of care. Um, I think a lot of younger generation want to preserve the option of, well, you know, can I be part of a larger organization, but also give me the flexibility to be portable? You know, do if I, you know, my husband or wife or partner um, decides to move to California and we're in Arizona or vice versa, you know, how do how can I do that? You know, kind of that that more nature of kind of ongoing uh, mobility and things like that. Obviously, um, the practice of dentistry takes place in an office, so the concept of remote work for a lot of other millennials um, is not as uh, <laughs> option for them. But I definitely think that there's that idea of workforce portability. Plus, I think they want to still be entrepreneurial, but have flexibility and support to do that. For a lot of the other reasons, you know, we've mentioned um, because the student debt costs, you know, uh, things like that. So, um, and, and I'm actually seeing it within our organization too. You know, there's kind of the 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 first generation of DSO leaders and, and second generation that are you know coming in that wake and how they're doing business a little differently and, and everything else. So, um, it, it's really interesting to see kind of the continued enhancement of dentistry and making sure that there are multiple options and pathways for for all generations. Uh, one interesting thing as we talk about generational changes, and I think it was mentioned at the beginning, we now have on a very consistent basis, 50% women 
graduating from dental schools. And I saw some statistics from women in DSO where they said that women basically have about a 20% workload outside of work that most men don't have. So if you translate that the other way, they need some flexibility or you're going to get about 80% of the same productivity in the dental office. I think we're going to start seeing on a generational basis with the portability, with the changing in demographics, that shift work is going to become more critical. Flexibility. Hey, I want to work two days a week. I want to work three days a week. I can work evenings. I can work mornings, et cetera. It's hard to do that in a single dental practice. You're going to need some sophistication on scheduling and HR and so forth to be able to support that dentist if that's what they want in their life. So I think that's going to be really interesting. Of course, I feel like with COVID and everyone working from home and trying to figure out flexibility, um, that became more critical. I think the load that all of us have too with COVID, if all it was, was your parents got sick, that domino down to you having to help with them, that domino down with you needing support, et cetera. So I'm just seeing all of these shift kind of leading towards the same thing, which is universally any industry, I need more support, you know, in order to achieve what I'm defining as success today. A absolutely. And in fact, Emmett, it's a very good point. And, you know, I work across many different industries and this, this whole great resignation, great reckoning, great redefinition, call it what you will, it's affecting everybody. And it is causing organizations to relook the model of work. This idea that says 40 hours a week, eight hours a day, period, that's how we work. And if you don't like it, go somewhere else. That's not necessarily tenable anymore, which puts a whole different kind of pressure on the organization and particularly in healthcare, because, you know, you're not manufacturing widgets, you're, you're changing people's lives in many ways. And so it's got to be done in a very measured and careful way, but it is indeed happening. I want to, I want to move on to the next question. And this is a, this is a kind of an interesting one because it, it shifts us into a, in a, a more granular specific discussion area. What I do not want our audience to walk away with is this idea that says, well, they're talking about all the right things, but we know that as soon as this webinar is over, they're going to go back to doing what they've always done. We don't want them to think that this is a, we're going to hold hands and you know, sing we are the world. That's not what this is about. <laughs> I want to ask you very specifically, and, and, and I'm going to start, uh, Emmett and Andrew, I'm going to start with you. What are you doing specifically from a collaboration point of view? to work more closely with the ADA? What kinds of things are y'all doing? And then I'm gonna ask, and it may be the same answer actually when I, with, from both sides, but I'd like to know so that people can walk out saying, wow, you know, they're actually doing some interesting things. It's, it was good to hear that. What, what would you say? What kind of things do you see happening? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kick things off here. <clears throat> um, you know, I think probably the, the most relevant uh, aspect, you know, Dr. Comia talked about it, um, you know, ADA has a phenomenal um, history and current uh, role with advocacy, particularly with policymakers. And, you know, one of my first meetings that I had coming on as the ED of ADSO was with the ADA um, public policy team. And I know my, my team that focused on government relations and the ADA's team, are working hand in glove on issues that are facing the industry, both at the federal level, especially around student debt relief. We're currently working together on, on some core legislation there. In fact, we have um, ADSO has their Washington DC flying in two weeks. And I know uh, members of the ADA government relations team will be there and talking and collaborating. But then also we're, we're working <clears throat> very well with many of the state dental associations that have really strong relationships, obviously with, with national ADA um, around core issues like third-party payer reform. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, my commitment to my members is creating value and growth for their businesses uh, and payer reform is a huge component of that. And so I think we're, we're talking about, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 states that we can jointly work together on with other policymakers and figure out how we can move that ball forward to strengthen um, all of our professions. That's just one uh, aspect, but it is very collaborative, very cohesive, uh, ongoing. In fact, I'm going to be in Chicago next week, and I'm going to be sitting down with uh, Marco and talking about the data collection that uh, ADSO has done, and as well as ADA, and figuring out how we can jointly share in that. So, you know, those are just a few small examples, um, but we're very, very committed to to working together. 
I'll just dovetail in exactly echoing what Andrew said. If people want to help in this, uh, one of the things that we're doing is getting involved more and more at the state level. I feel like at the national level, there's some amazing momentum uh, where we're working together, but this is a state by state organization as well. And so sitting down, I'm located in Texas with the TDA recently. I've talked through Zoom with several other state associations and they're just ready to have dentists working together, you know? And so there's so much for us to work on externally. I think those need to happen on a state by state basis. And we're starting to kind of rally the troops around that. Because again, that external component has really taken advantage, I feel like of some of the misalignment we had internally. And now that we have this alignment, like we need to start moving forward uh, with that momentum. Interesting. In the interest of time, let me, uh, if, unless you've got a very specific uh, additional uh, sort of example that we want to share, let me, let me ask this. What's the danger of not collaborating? I mean, what happens if we don't? Let me, let me give this to the ADA. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Steve, by collaborating, we're stronger. Uh, by not collaborating, we're not going to be moving the profession forward. I'll give you another example of a collaborative uh, movement we just finished doing. We, we uh, at the board of trustees level, uh, something that has always interested us is this uh, uh, medical dental, um, you know, integration. And we had one of the uh, ADSO members uh, present uh, to the board uh, over the last uh, several weeks, as, as well as the president of, of the American Medical Association. So these collaborations are, are, are very vital into moving the profession forward and serving our profession and serving uh, all of our patients so that they can uh, each have uh, the best possible health uh, and, and we can elevate this nation's health. So this collaboration is extremely important. And you mentioned about singing We Are The World. I, I don't think we're gonna be singing We Are The World, but I would hope that we will sing Kumbaya. And uh, we, we, are, we have been moving forward and I'm extremely proud of this collaboration that we have with ADSO. And I think we're just going to elevate the profession. Excellent. You know, Steve, collaboration and coming together, what do we lose? We lose everything, to be honest with you. We really do. We, we lose, we, we become so fragmented and so independent that we don't have a common voice being represented to our profession, to what we need to do. You know, so what has the ADA done? I will tell you quickly, um, we've done two things that are really big right now. One is we're developing an app. And what does that do thing? I've already met with Andrew on this because part of the app is learning, you know, dental home is exposing our graduates of today and our practitioners, what their opportunities are in practice. That's a collaboration. If we don't stand to hold that together, meaning supporting all these aspects, it's going to fragment us. So ultimately through the app, I'm actually partnering with them. We're going to be working with a lot of our business affiliation groups in phase two of the app, bringing them together to let them carry their message, to explain what they're trying to do and how we all come together because we all fit in this umbrella. You know, second thing is that the, pres the pressures today of dentistry are enormous. They really are. The graduates, when you look at uh, the pressures of the debt load and what they're trying to accomplish, the coming together allows us to work with well-being resources, which we're putting a part of the app to. And this is something we all have to work together. So the strength of us all collaborating, coming together, we can all put a piece that delivers a message of support to everybody and all our future practitioners and colleagues and the individuals in our dental team membership, our dental team uh, delivery care methods that ultimately provide better care for the future of all the people that we serve. So we stand a lot to lose if we don't collaborate. I mean, can I be real? No. Can I be real specific on some things? The yeah. external forces will crush us if we don't they work will. together. There's they too will, much man. innovation that needs to happen. And frankly, I'll just give you a real example. How does a payer determine that they're not going to pay for PPE? How does yeah. that happen? How do they cut rates during a pandemic? Mm -hmm. That happens because we don't have total alignment to be able to push back. So the ability for external forces to move in on us if we don't have alignment, tons to lose. Work well said, together well said. and we can move healthcare to the next level. Well said. 100%. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Okay, I'm going to ask the question now that I've been waiting for an answer to throughout this thing. This is the one I'm most intrigued about. I'd like you to look three to five years out 
in terms of things like education, development, self-governance, the, the very future of the organization and the future of the practice of dentistry, technologically, economically, from a healthcare perspective, from a compassionate care perspective, where are we? What does the future look like in this, in this organization, this industry, three to five years out? And I'm just going to throw it out there and let y'all decide because there's no winner on this one. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I think I'll, I'll just kick it off. I mean, I think the um, the use of technology, um, I think, will be, you know, no surprise. We've talked a lot about technology and how that revolutionizes our society. So no surprise here with dentistry. But, you know, as, as more and more um, things like CBTC scanners, as well as other AI, making practices more efficient that way, but also delivering the care that the patient wants. As Emmett mentioned, more and more patients are in the driver's seat about the type of care they want and the consumerism that they want. You know, they want different hours, you know, all these other things. So it's going to, I think, move much more to patient centric and having those technologies to meet those needs is, is huge. And also to really, you know, give the best standard of care. And then finally, you know, we've talked a lot about payer reform. I think the use of technology will also showcase the need for, you know, ongoing treatment and how that will reduce the overall costs to um, both the payers and the provider, as well as delivering great patient care. So, I mean, I see that as kind of the, the next natural step um, on kind of how dentistry will grow. Yeah, could we reduce it down to say better providers providing better care right. because they're getting better support than they've ever gotten, right? And I think that's how I'd love to see this move forward because that lifts everybody. Um, and that really brings it together with ADA being able to say, hey, ADSO, could you solve all this back office stuff? <laughs> Because we've got, you know, we've got all this science we're doing, all this clinical piece. We've got all this technology coming down the pipe. Can you get us massive support so that we can provide this innovation and care? One of the things that I've noticed is with all of this change in on the HR side, it's been hard for dentists to innovate. You know, they're not buying as many scanners or doing because they're like, I just need to keep my practice manager right now and those kind of things. So I, I think those kind of supports will drive higher innovation that ADA can, can help with. I like that. I like that. Better providers giving better care. Yeah, you've got a future in the coffee cup and bumper sticker business, man. You should add a division. All that's, mark cards. That's, that's, yeah, that's very good. Let me uh, keep going here, gentlemen. I, I see uh, an elevated system of healthcare. I see where finally uh, dentists are truly considered uh, essential healthcare providers. I see technology helping uh, increase the way that we provide services and care to our patients. I see as dentists as primary healthcare providers in that we were gonna be screening for diabetes, uh, uh, issues with uh, hypertension, other issues related to the overall healthcare of the patients. And I think that the dentists are gonna be one of the center, uh, the center of that change. You know, when you, I'm excited as we approach, Steve, when you're talking about three, five, seven years out, all these dreams that we're talking about can indeed become a reality. When we talk about less of a workforce shortage, we, we've alleviated the workforce problems. You know, technology, as you said, becomes a big factor. Dentistry being accepted as a predominant essential healthcare, no doubt about it, but also the fact that we've helped our practitioners alleviate those financial dental burdens, you know, the, the dental student burdens of the student debt becomes a big factor as we move forward. I see us actually coming together and actually making a change. And as one of our former presidents used to say, moving the needle in the right direction to really make some honest, wonderful things for the future of the profession and the people we serve. I see all those things in the palm of our hand that we have the opportunity. And it's only going to happen as we continue to work together as a congenial group, as all coming together, instead of walking again, talking about our differences, but talk about our similarities and what we can accomplish together. Let's keep our eyes on the goal. My dad used to say, obstacles are, are what you see when you take your eyes off your goal. And obstacles are the only thing that you see if you don't have a goal. If we keep a goal constantly in our vision that we're trying to improve people's and patients' lives, 
then I see those three to five years of what each of these individual wonderful colleagues of mine just said, I see them all becoming a reality and totally achievable in everything that we're talking about. So I'm excited about that, Steve. Very excited. And, and you know, what I, I what I like about what I just heard is that I didn't hear a long series of platitudes. I heard a lot of very specific things that indicated to me that both of these organizations are thinking long and hard about the fact that, number one, we want to still be here three to five years from now, and we want to be more relevant than we've ever been. And we want to be part of this great industry that we are, in fact, in the business of supporting. So I think that's a really critical part of this thing. So my very last question, open-ended. And uh, Emmett, I'm going to start with you. Any last thoughts for our audience today? Anything we haven't talked about or any point you'd like to make? No, I, I really appreciate this. I, I think the main point is you can accomplish more together. And, and that's been said. You know, there's just so many external things. I, I think if you're looking at the dentist that's down the street from you, that's not where your competition is. So I'll just tell you as a capitalist, the competition is all the other things that person can do on their phone or otherwise. And so together we can start getting the consumers, the patients to understand how important dentistry is. Excellent point. Andrew? Um, I'm just excited about this partnership. You know, when I joined ADSO a year and a half ago, <clears throat> there was a lot of comments about, oh, you know, we need to do more with ADA and, you know, all of this. And and just to where we are in 18 months, uh, and thank you to the leadership of Dr. Sabatis and, and, and Dr. Colnia for allowing us to partner with you is, is phenomenal. And I'm just excited about our ongoing collaboration. And I think it's also the two of our organizations should be leading the way in bringing all of those in dentistry involved and, you know, kind of creating, if you will, a five families or more of, uh, of, of, of the dental uh, industry. So I'm just, I'm just thankful to, to be part of this and thank you for everyone's leadership. Excellent. Excellent. Ray. You know, as I think about what we can accomplish together, I was once told that, an individual organization working separately cannot reach the power of three or four or five or, or many, many combined together. In other words, when you're looking at organizations, two plus two plus two doesn't equal six. Two plus two plus two equals 50. It, it, the power of the exponential ability when we come together as, as groups and start to focus on really focusing on the profession, really focusing on what can we do to improve people's life? What can we do? I think that we can all come together. I, I love what we're doing right now. I think this is our first big step, and the idea is to bring more and more organizations all together, again, focusing upon that. So I'm really excited what we'll be accomplished today, and thank you all so much for your time and efforts in this. This needs to be one of many, but as you can see, we have a lot of things to talk about. So thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to come together today. Thank you, sir. Say so. Steve, uh, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Emmett, Andrew, and uh, Dr. Colmia. It, it has uh, been a true honor. Uh, to represent everyone as the president of the American Dental Association. And as I've said before, it, it is a new day for dentistry. And what I want for us to all keep in mind is that we are here to serve our patients and to improve the health of Americans. And I think this collaboration, this cooperation that we have between ADSO and the ADA, is just going to help increase uh, the patient's uh, uh, well-being and the care for our patients. So anything we can do to continue this collaboration, I encourage. I want to thank all of you, and it's been a privilege to work with you over this past several years, and I look forward to a bright future. So thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Folks, if you have questions, please send them to the address on the slide. Thank you again. We'll see you in the next program.